Well, good morning, Crossway Baptist Church. Uh, thank you for allowing me to come and to be able to present to you what the Lord is doing in our lives. And, um, uh, you know, I was a little worried that maybe uh, Pastor Jason wouldn't want me to come. I was a bit of a, a slow learner in college. Um, I was a bit goofy. Um, I wasn't always the uh, serious one around the dorm, and I'm sure he's probably got some interesting memories of me um, from those days, but uh, I'm glad that he was uh, so gracious to allow me to come. Unfortunately, as he mentioned, uh, my family is not feeling well, um, and so they stayed home for this trip, but uh, thankfully the ward kept me safe on the way up. It was a bit of a drive, um, but uh, you know, we're here now and that's all that matters. So um, thankfully, uh, the Lord has kept us safe throughout um, our travel so far, and uh, I know he will continue to do so. But if you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19. And we're going to read one verse just to begin in Luke chapter 19. But we're going to go to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. And Jesus is speaking, and he says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. We're going to pray, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how Jesus came to love the unlovely and can make missionaries sometimes out of the most likely of people. So let's pray. God, thank you for the time we have together here. We thank you for uh, your faithfulness to us. We pray that you will allow us to continue to be faithful, that you will, uh, we pray that we will continue to be faithful to you. We thank you that you are always faithful and for your love and for your protection on my travel so far, and uh, we thank you for Crossway Baptist Church and their willingness to stand here and proclaim the truth, and Pastor Jason, as he uh, does his best to lead uh, your people here, and I pray that you will continue to bless him and give him wisdom as you've put him here as their pastor. In your name, amen. So, as we read in Luke chapter 19, uh, verse 10 here, Jesus pretty much gives the entirety of his purpose statement. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus himself came to earth as a missionary. Jesus himself came to earth as a missionary. The whole purpose of Jesus' coming was to find those that had not yet received the love of God, that had not accepted salvation for themselves, and he had come to present that to them. But I think that this verse is really interesting to point out because of the immediate context of the first portion of Luke chapter 19. It tells a story of a particularly short man. And many of you probably already have a song from Sunday school going back through your head about a man named Zacchaeus who was a wee little man. And so many of us probably know that story and could probably tell this story for the most part. But we're going to look at how Jesus came and loved somebody who was very unlovely. And then used that person as an unlikely missionary. Because if you think about it, Zacchaeus, when his life changed, then had something to tell. And I know that many times we come across people in our lives who aren't always the loveliest. I think we can say that. We've all met somebody in our lives who kind of just has it out for us. For whatever reason, they don't get along with us. They don't like us. They try to make our life difficult at work or what have you. And there are people that, that in our lives, in and of ourselves, we could never truly love on our own. But Jesus, perfect as he is, came and loved the whole world. As we know in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever 
believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus said he came with that love of God to seek and to save those which were lost. So we're going to do a quick overview real quick of this story here. And we're going to start in verse number one. It says, and Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And does anybody remember Jericho? There's a specific battle that happens in the Old Testament. God gives very interesting instructions to the children of Israel for this. He says, you're going to come upon this city right there at the edge of, at the edge of Canaan. We're going to send you in to go conquer the land, and I'm going to give you the promised land. But there was one problem. Jericho stood in the way. Now, Jericho had a very specific feature that made them nearly impenetrable, and it was a massive wall that there was no way that the children of Israel would be able to overcome with God's help. So God told them, this is what I want you to do. He says, go to Jericho, walk around the city one time for six days, and on the seventh day, walk around seven times, blow the trumpets, the priests will shout, and the walls will fall down, and I will deliver Jericho into your hand. But even in spite of all of that, God still showed his missionary heart and saved a lady by the name of Rahab. Think about that. Rahab was known for one specific thing in that city, and she didn't have a very good reputation. But God still willingly saved her. He had come to seek and to save the lost. Rahab was lost, and God said, I love you regardless of who you are and what you have done. And he saved Rahab and then put her in the line of Jesus Christ. And she became an unlikely missionary, I'm sure. Because those, who were, those that were in her family probably looked at her and thought, you're crazy. What do you mean you're going to go follow the God of the Hebrews? Don't you know that we have our own idols that we worship here in Jericho? Hey, Israel's never going to conquer us. We have this wall. We'll be okay. But thankfully, some of her family listened. And those that were in the home were spared. But God saved Rahab in spite of who she was and how she lived. And he does very much the same thing with Zacchaeus. That's why I think that the setting of this is so interesting. Because Zacchaeus lived in Jericho. He was right there in the same place where God had saved somebody else who many people would look at and say they don't deserve it. Many people probably disliked her, and that's exactly where Zacchaeus found himself. He was a tax collector. Now, we've just come through tax season. And I'm not a big fan of paying taxes, I'll be honest. Taxes are rough. I don't like to watch, I don't like to look at the difference in numbers on my paycheck very often. But that's what Zacchaeus did. He would go around and he would collect the taxes from those that owed them, so everybody, and he had managed to find ways in order to be able to pocket a little bit of extra for himself. So Zacchaeus was known as a thief. Now, I know many of us probably consider taxes thievery, but I don't believe that it's exactly the same way that Zacchaeus did it because he was the one getting rich off of it. But as we see in, in verse 2, it says, And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was chief among the publicans, and he was rich, but off everybody else. And in verse 3, And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. Zacchaeus had heard about this Jesus person. He knew that Jesus had changed lives. Perhaps he had heard about the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turned water into wine. Or maybe he had heard how Jesus was willing to heal somebody who was crippled. He knew one thing, that Jesus could change lives. And Zacchaeus was curious what Jesus would do for him. Now, I don't know if Zacchaeus necessarily had the best intention going in, but we see that God was willing to work with that. He said, all I need is a little bit of curiosity, Zacchaeus, and I'll, and I'll change you for the better. And that's exactly what Jesus did through that encounter. We see in verse, 
We see in verse 4, it says, And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, Jesus, for he was to pass that way. I can kind of picture Zacchaeus kind of scoping out the city and seeing where Jesus was. And he goes, all right, well, if, well, if Jesus follows this path here, then I can, I can get in front of everybody and I can maybe climb up in this tree up here and I can kind of spot him out. And that's exactly what he did. He said, hey, I may not be tall, but I've got a plan. Has anybody here ever been at a parade or something and somebody tall stands right in front of you and you're like, why am I even here? I'm sure we've all had those moments when we're trying to look at something and then somebody just suddenly appears before you and, well, now I'm stuck. Has that ever happened at the grocery store? I think that's the worst place because I'll be standing back looking at the shelves and trying to figure out what I'm trying to buy and somebody walks right in front of me and stops. Well... I guess I'll wait. Zacchaeus, unfortunately, didn't have that option. There was a large group around Jesus. Zacchaeus was short. There wasn't any way that he was going to be able to see around everybody. So he came up with his own plan and climbed up in a sycamore tree and waited. He said, I see Jesus coming this way. I want to see who Jesus is. What is he all about? So in verse 5, it says, And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. And said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Hey, I don't think Zacchaeus had any idea that Jesus even knew his name. But I think that it's interesting that as Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, he made every one of us, and he knows each of us in our own specific situation, and he's willing to love us despite being unlovely. And even through that, he then chooses and is willing to use us like the like Pastor and uh, Mrs. Borman saying this morning, that if we would just choose, that we could be the one ourselves to go and take the gospel to somebody else. I think the last verse of that song is the best because it says, I will be that one. Hey, all it takes is a little bit of surrender and say, Lord, use me. Lord, use me. And he'll be willing to. I know that there were people in college, I know that there were people in college who looked at me when I said, I want to go to Korea, and they said, ain't no way. That guy's never going to make it. I know there were. I don't know who they were specifically, but I know that there were people who probably looked at me and said, there's no way God's going to use him in that way. Well, I said, God, I'm willing to go if you'll just let me. And thankfully, God is willing to use me in spite of me, although I am unlovely like every other person here because we're all sinners. But God chose to love me anyway, and he's willing to use me if I am willing to be used. And that's the important part. I think a lot of times we, we forget who we are in the sight of God. Sometimes we decide... Well, you know, how wonderful that God gets to use somebody like me. Because I have nothing to offer him. And that's the only appropriate response. The problem is, is when we get proud and we decide, hey, look, God can use me because I'm so wonderful. <laughs> that wasn't Zacchaeus' response. All he wanted to do was see Jesus. But Jesus stopped at the tree it says, he came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste, come quickly. Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house. I know a lot of times as we teach children motions to that song, for some reason it's been taught, Zacchaeus, you come down. I don't think Jesus was upset with Zacchaeus. I think Jesus was offering. He said, hey, Zacchaeus, come on down, come quickly. For today, I'm going to your house. He said, out of everybody in Jericho, Zacchaeus, your house is the one I am going to spend time with. Why? Because he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Hey, nobody else in town was that much of a friend of Zacchaeus. Why? Zacchaeus had stolen from him and their family 
and their friends and everybody else around. Zacchaeus was known for this. Hey, if I knew somebody was stealing from me, I wouldn't want them to see Jesus either. Let's be honest. I'm not perfect. But God was willing to visit him in his specific situation and love him anyway. I think it's first of all that we see that Jesus validated his solitude. Jesus validated his solitude. Hey, Zacchaeus was probably a lonely person. Zacchaeus didn't have many friends. It wasn't like people were ushering him to the front of the crowd to be able to see Jesus. I kind of picture people blocking Zacchaeus off when they saw him coming. Hey, why do you think Zacchaeus had to run so far ahead? Because I'm sure people were trying to, to usher Zacchaeus off to the side. No, you can't see Jesus. You're not worthy. Jesus doesn't want to spend time with somebody like you, Zacchaeus. He's got he's to talk to us important people because we're, we're the religious people. Yeah, but that's exactly who Jesus wants. Are those who know they need help. Those who can look at their life honestly and say, Hey, before God, I am only a sinner and I have nothing to offer him except my humility and my broken spirit. All in all, that's all we have. Yes, God has given us each something unique in ways of talents. But they're not going to mean anything unless, unless we allow him to use us with those. We see that Zacchaeus probably just needed a friend. Zacchaeus needed a friend. Sure, we've all probably had moments where we felt lonely, especially probably during COVID. During the COVID times when they were locking everybody indoors. Hey, thankfully, we have a little bit easier way to communicate nowadays with cell phones and the internet. But hey, there's nothing like seeing somebody else face to face and having that camaraderie and that friendship in person. Hey, cell phones are great, but they'll never, they'll never quite have that same level of friendship with somebody who's not physically there. Last night I called my wife on the phone. Hey, it was great to talk to her. I got to see her on video and my girls, but it's not the same as if they were there. It was still nice, but it's not, I, you know, it's not the best. It's not the ideal situation. But Zacchaeus didn't have any friends that he could go to and say, hey, I need help to see Jesus. But then we see also that he needed absolute forgiveness. Zacchaeus needed absolute forgiveness. He knew he was wrong. In verse 7 it says, And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. Hey, so these are the religious people, not letting Zacchaeus see Jesus, that were mad at Jesus. They said, Jesus wants to spend time with us. Well, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house out of everybody here in Jericho. And all the religious people got upset. You're going to his house? Don't you know who he is? That's Zacchaeus. We don't talk to Zacchaeus. He doesn't deserve you. You should come to my house. Look what I've done for you. I keep the law. I haven't ever stolen anything from anybody that they know about. Right? And we can sometimes get this idea that, hey, you know, that person over there, they're not, they're unlovely. Jesus couldn't want them. But the fact is, that's exactly who Jesus looks for. But then we see that also that Jesus visited his situation. Jesus validated his solitude. Jesus visited his situation. He stopped at the tree. Hey, this was unique. Jesus is walking by and there's some grown man up in a tree. Imagine that in a robe. This guy didn't have pants on. It's awkward. Okay. And Jesus stopped the entire crowd and said, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house. Come on down. Come quickly. 
And Zacchaeus is probably trying to climb down and do it modestly, right? But trying to move quickly because that's what Jesus said. And the entire crowd's just standing there like, what is going on? We're all waiting for this. Out of everything in town, Jesus stops all of us for Zacchaeus to get out of a tree. What's he even doing up there? And you can kind of just picture it, the whole crowd. What's Jesus looking at? Oh, there's somebody up there. Oh, it's not just somebody, it's Zacchaeus. Hey, Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house, is what Jesus said. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Did I hear that right? Jesus is going to, to Zacchaeus' house? He's up in this tree looking like a fool, climbing down. On top of that, he's not the most ideal person in town, but Jesus is going to, to, to his house? Hey, Jesus visited that specific situation. He stopped at the tree and he went to his home. Now, there's something special about being invited in somebody's home. That's how you know you're close friends. <laughs> hey, if somebody's willing to let you in and see their mess, that's a special kind of friendship. I don't have very many people over to my apartment, mainly because I have two little kids. And it's difficult to try to keep everything presentable. You know, everybody here probably knows what I mean, especially if you have kids. Hey, it's difficult. I don't like to have company over because I'm embarrassed. Hey, they're going to see a side of me that, ugh. I better clean that up real quick. So company's coming. We all remember that probably growing up. Mom, mom yells downstairs or into the room, hey, uh, somebody's coming for dinner. Y'all better clean up. What? When are they going to be here? Oh, 30 minutes. Oh, great. You know, and then it's the mad dash around the house. Everybody's chipping in. Don't let them see the mess. Clean it up. But Jesus was willing to go to Zacchaeus and see his mess. He was willing to say, hey, I know that there are things here that aren't the prettiest, but I'm willing to go and spend time with you in spite of what I might find. Now, obviously, Jesus already knew everything about Zacchaeus and didn't have to learn anything. But he still went knowing everything about Zacchaeus. And then we see also that he was willing, that Jesus verified his salvation. Jesus verified his salvation. We're going to go, we're going to go to verse 8. It says, And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, I think that's interesting because that's what the law said to do. As I, was, I noticed that as I was reading through the book of Leviticus this year at the beginning of the year, I know everybody struggles getting through Leviticus because it's all of the Old Testament law. And not necessarily all of it applies for us today to specifically fulfill it. But in the law, it says if you stole something and you are caught, you are required to repay four times the amount you stole. So let's say somebody's coming over, you weren't prepared, you took a sheep from your neighbor, didn't let them know. If that neighbor catches you, you return four sheep. So Jesus said, hey, if I stole anything from false accusation, hey, if I told somebody that they owed such and such, okay, you owe $300 when in fact they only owed 296 okay that's four dollars he stole so he would pay four times back he would give them sixteen dollars back but Zacchaeus was rich he had the means to do this and he understood that if Jesus was willing to come and forgive him that Jesus was willing to come and visit his mess at his home and to stop the entirety of the city of Jericho just for him in a tree, embarrassing himself so he could see Jesus. Then he knew that if Jesus was willing to come there, that he needed to change for Jesus. 
He said, if Jesus is loving me enough to come to me, I can change for him. And that's what all of our response should be when Jesus comes and is willing to come to us. And he did. Think about it. Jesus left heaven, a place of perfection, and came and lived on this nasty, dirty earth with nasty, dirty people and was born in a filthy stable and gave up everything he had to come to us. The very least we can do is change for him. And so Zacchaeus is saying, I'm going to do all this. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation. Come to thy, this house, for as much as he is also a son of Abraham. Do you imagine that? Out of everybody in Jericho, all the religious leaders, all the people who were there early for Saturday morning Torah class, because they didn't have Sunday school. That's kind of like their version, Saturday morning Torah class. They'd go learn about the law. All the people who had memorized massive portions, which if we know some of them probably had similar backgrounds to Nicodemus, knew, had probably memorized the first five books of the Bible and could quote it. Word for word in Hebrew, which is a little bit harder to pronounce than English. I studied a little bit of, of it in college. It was something. But Jesus didn't go to those religious leaders who had memorized massive portions of scripture. It wasn't to their house he went. He came to seek and to save the lost and made time for a sinner, which is what they complained about in verse 7. Hey, he's going to eat with a sinner. He's willing to be a guest in the house of a sinner. How dare Jesus spend time with sinners when we're so perfect? And Jesus corrects him in verse 10. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. If you're so perfect, why do you need me? That's pretty much what Jesus is saying. Hey, if you're so perfect, why do you even need me? The sinner is why I'm here. For people like Zacchaeus is why Jesus came. We see that Jesus said that salvation has come to this house. Jesus verified his salvation. He said it outright. He said, Zacchaeus is now saved. I don't think Zacchaeus ever had to doubt his salvation. I know sometimes that's a problem for some people when they, if they're saved at a younger age, they don't always remember. They're like, well, well, did I really understand? Did I know everything that was happening, this and that? Hey, Zacchaeus didn't have that issue. God himself said, you are saved. There was no question about it. But think of what that said to everybody else in town. Hey, if Zacchaeus can be saved, if Zacchaeus can go and give back fourfold of what he stole, and then that was what made Zacchaeus a missionary then because he went out and fulfilled the law and did what he was supposed to do, not in order to receive salvation, but because of salvation, he went out and did what he ought to do. And we see that Jesus said he is a child of Abraham. Now we understand that God so loved the world that he gave the, his only begotten son, but Jesus said he had come specifically for the, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In his first coming, he came to save the children of Israel from their sin. And we, I think we understand that. Now obviously he came for the whole world and there were other people that while he was on earth that he reached that were not Jewish. But he said, hey, because the Jewish people had it in their head that they were so special, he says, hey, since you guys are so special as children of Abraham, hey, so is Zacchaeus. Hey, he may not be the perfect poster child, but he's still an Israelite. And hey, I may not be the perfect poster child of what a missionary ought to be. I'm going to make mistakes. There are going to be things I do that people are going to look at and be like, what were you thinking? And I tell them, I don't know. I thought that's what we did. 
and we're going to have plenty of those. Hey, I may not be the perfect poster child for what missionaries ought to do, but I know one thing, that if God was willing to save somebody like Zacchaeus and he was willing to save me, and if Zacchaeus can use that salvation and turn his life around, then God can be willing to use me in spite of me. Even when there are times that I am unlovely. So just to recap, we see that Jesus validated his solitude, Jesus visited his situation, and Jesus verified his salvation. And then from that, Zacchaeus himself became a missionary and was willing to be used by God and as Pastor and Mrs. Borman say, he became that one. He was willing to allow God to use his life to reach somebody else.